You read the title? I want to talk about speed. Not talking about drugs. Not talking about auto racing. I'm not talking about feeling the need for speed, Top Gun. I'm not talking about track and field. I'm talking about the speed at which the world we live in is changing today, which I see as the macro problem, which is forming all the little micro problems we usually talk about. What do I mean by micro and macro problems? Basically, all my videos that I've posted are micro problem videos. You know, political problems, PC, you know, whatever it is, interpretations of the Second Amendment, doesn't matter. These are all micro issues, important issues. I'm not saying they're not important, but there's an overarching, what I would call macro problem that we don't address, that most people, not only do we not address it, I don't even think most people even think about it. And I think that's the main problem that I've seen for a long time. And that's what I want to try to get at in this video. I don't know how many years ago it was, probably close to 20 years ago. I was in Barnes and Noble and they had the skid with the books that are reduced to a dollar. And it was a book by Bill Gates. It's called Business at the Speed of Thought. And I picked it up and I read the back jacket cover and the inside thing. And I thought, yeah, this is pretty interesting. And the reason I found it interesting was that I had recently, at that time when I found the book, the book was already several years old, had published a book that I did called Command at Sea, which dealt with command and control issues. And I had started to come to the conclusion that looking beyond the narrow focus of my book, Command and Control of Naval Forces, I saw the same issue everywhere in society. And that issue dealt with what Gates was getting at in his book, business, not just business, but everything happening at the speed of thought. If you take what Gates was talking about, I may say it was a very unsuccessful book. It was, you know, it was on sale for a dollar. He, it was a great idea. He had a really big idea for the book. But it probably should have been like a 10-minute YouTube video or, or a, a short article or an essay. But, you know, you want to make the big bucks, you get a big advantage, you do a book. The problem was it just got too repetitive. So I read, you know, the intro conclusions and that was it. But after reading the book and putting some of his ideas together with issues that I had formulated when I wrote my book on command problems and naval forces, I came to some larger, what I would call macro conclusions about the problems we were seeing in the world. In my view, there's basically two problems. And they're interrelated, of course. The first problem is, I believe that humans today are no more intelligent than they were 2,000, 2,500, maybe even 3,000 years ago. I mean, collectively, we're certainly more literate, more people can read, more people have some education. But I don't think we're any smarter today than we were two millennia ago. I mean, I, I taught history for years. I was in a history department at ECU, East Carolina University. I never ran across a fellow historian there or anywhere else in the profession where after talking to this person, I thought, my God, he's like... Herodotus, or, or, or she's like uh, Arian, or this guy's like even Khaldun. I mean, it, it, no, none of us were on par with any of those historians that they were writing, you know, 2,000 years ago. The philosophers that I met, you know, I never said, oh my God, I, you know, I haven't read anything like this since Descartes. Uh, or Kant, or, you know, just Socrates, like, oh my God, talking to him is like talking to Aristotle. <laughs> no, that's not what happened. I mean, we're no more, I'm not saying there aren't brilliant people today like the people I've mentioned, but I don't think, and there's probably more of them today because the population is that much larger, but I don't think your individual average person 
who's some uh, government bureaucrat somewhere in Washington today is any more intelligent than a bureaucrat in Rome 2,000 years ago. That would basically be my point. Because what we're talking about is the administrative state, however you want to describe it, whatever form it might take. All states come down to some form of bureaucracy and administration. And I don't think we're any better at it than we were 2,000 years ago. The second problem is that the complexity of the world over the last 2,000 years has just changed enormously. Not just in terms of look at the world today, look at the world 2,000 years ago. I mean, look at the world today and look at the world 100 years ago. You know, I, my book was on naval command and control. I mean, there, there was, if you look at, say, military forces, there's a continuum. I mean, you could take Alexander the Great's army of, of say, an army of 40,000 men from uh, the fourth century BC. And if you drop that, transported it through time and dropped it in Europe somewhere around 1100, that army would probably kick the butt of any European army. If you took an army from 1900 and put it on a battlefield with an army in 2000, they would be slaughtered, even though there's only a 100-year difference. Whereas the Alexander example, there's a 1,400-year difference. It's not just that things are advancing. They're advancing at an ever greater pace. You know, instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we're going 2, 4, 16, 32, 64. That's the problem. Moore's law, computer processing power doubling every 18 months. That's the kind of situation we face. So we have this increasingly complex world, you know, with billions of people, all these problems, all these systems, all this technology, and the people trying to regulate it, the governments, are no smarter than they were 2,000 years ago. Now, admittedly, they have technology they didn't have 2,000 years ago to help them administer this state. But what I found in, in my study of naval command and control is, and, and looking at technology in general and science in general, you know, if you're a shepherd and you lay on the ground and you look up at the stars and you can see all the stars and you count them and you say, this is wonderful, I wish I could see further. And then, you know, several centuries later, somebody invents the telescope and you look at the same star and now you can see that star much better. But you also realize there's like 10,000 stars beyond that star that you couldn't even see before. You say, my God, if I only had a better telescope. And then you get a better telescope and you look at the new stars that you just found. And then you find there's another set of them behind there. I mean, that's the nature of science. We're always chasing a kind of a chimera. We're always pushing a horizon. But the horizon just keeps expanding because it's the universe. That's the nature of the universe. There's no end to it. So we're dealing with a, an infinite universe with a finite brain. And even the technology we get, which helps us deal with what the problems we have, just become much more complex. You know, the complex, the, the technology that went from in 1800, you know, they were hauling, hoisting flags up to send signals for communications at sea. You know, a century and a half later, they have radio telephony. They can, you know, Arlie Burke can pick up a telephone and talk to his, the ships in his squadron. So he said, well, that's a great advance from 1800 to, you know, 1943. And it was. The problem was the nature of war at sea is now instead of ships doing two knots, they're doing 30 or 35 knots, as Burke was called 35 knot Burke. They're fighting in the dark. They're, they're fighting using radar. The ranges are greater. Instead of firing at 300 or 400 yards, they're firing at miles. So the, the complexity has advanced well beyond the advance of the communications technology they have. And basically, Arlie Burke finds himself in the South Pacific in the same position Nelson was in. Things are happening too quickly for him to command his ships. I would argue that if you look at the problems we face in the world today, at the macro level, there is no political economic system that we know of today, 
you know, off the shelf Paul Mill system, Paul Econ system that we could adopt that'll solve our problems. Market capitalism isn't doing it. Socialism isn't the answer. Marxism isn't the answer. Communism isn't the answer. Some sort of mixed society between, you know, the Chinese have a, you know, capitalist, communist hybrid system. That's not the answer. Islamism isn't the answer. A return to fundamental Christianity isn't the answer. There is no answer. All the feudalism certainly isn't the answer. All the political systems we have available to us are all inadequate to the problems we face today. Because ultimately, it gets down to any political military system, any state system involves administration and involves bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy cannot keep up with the changes and the speed of the changes that it has to deal with. I mean, if you look at, there's some sort of financial fraud in the markets. So the federal government decides it's got to regulate that. Fine. So you take a snapshot of a situation as it is when the fraud happened. And then you start drafting uh, legislation. The committees do their things. They have hearings. The lobbyists come in. The, uh, the groups come in. The uh, uh, interest groups come in. And they all lobby Congress. And then Congress starts drafting the laws, and it gets changed, and it gets sent back between the House and the Senate. You know, yada, yada, yada. They do all that. And then finally they get a bill, and finally it gets passed, and the president signs it. And then it's got to go to some executive agency that exists or have, they have to create. And then they got to write all their regulations. Well, okay, this is the law, but how do we actually do this? Now, how, how quickly can you get that done? Like a day or two? A week? A month? A year? Two years? Three years before that happens? What do you think's happened in the financial markets? Say it takes two years to get that legislation passed, set up with an administrative structure to, you know, do it to regulate it. By that point, what they're trying to regulate has probably already moved on and changed. There's no system, not capitalism, not socialism, nothing. There's no system today that can respond in a timely and efficient fashion to regulate the things that it, the administrative state seeks to regulate. It can't be done. I don't care what system you have. I think capitalism does less damage than all the other systems. But that doesn't mean it's adequate anymore. Capitalism had its day. It replaced mercantilism, which replaced feudalism, which replaced whatever you, know, you want to call what was before that. But I think it's important to understand one thing about capitalism, because I think that'll give us a clue about what needs to happen next. Capitalism and socialism have their differences, and hopefully you know what they are. To me, one of the fundamental differences between the two is socialism is an idea that was concocted by, by a bunch of guys sitting around, you know, in a library or a coffee shop somewhere in Switzerland, Germany, whatever. You know, oh, here's how things should run. It's, it's a concept. And of course, by definition, then, it's a concept for a model that was didn't even exist by the time they wrote the book because it had already changed. I mean, that's the problem with Marxism. And you see that with this collapse of the Soviet Union. Capitalism wasn't an idea. Nobody said Adam Smith didn't invent capitalism. Adam Smith was basically discovering, if you will, what was already going on. I mean, the Americans were in a revolution before Smith wrote the book Wealth of Nations. And the Americans were revolting because of the many problems that he had seen in his book. But we knew what those problems were intuitively. What he was doing was describing what was already taking place. Because capitalism developed. Capitalism is a description of a process 
that evolved as mercantilism, feudalism and mercantilism collapsed. It was replaced by this system that nobody conceived of. It just inadvertently developed. And then we went back and we called it capitalism. We gave it a name. Socialism, communism is the exact reverse. They came up with the idea and then they tried to force it on the an economy. And of course it didn't work. You know, feudalism was, wasn't an idea, it developed you know, on its own. Mercantilism developed on its own. Capitalism developed on its own. Now why that's important to understand is because whatever's gonna come post-capitalism, and something has to, it's gonna to have to develop on its own. I don't know what that is. I don't think anybody knows what that is. I don't think Bill Gates knows what it is. I think Bill Gates had a, a sense that something had to come. But I think the problem is that people see that the issues we face in the modern world are real. And all they intuitively can think of doing is more regulation, more government. That wasn't the answer. The answer to feudalism was less government, which is mercantilism, less regulation. The answer of mercant to the replacement for mercantilism was capitalism, which was even less regulation. And whatever's going to have to come next is going to be even probably less regulation. And that's counterintuitive. That's not what people want. The problems we face are real. There are all, all kinds of you know, inequalities of wealth and outcomes and all this stuff. That's real. You know, the question is, what do you do about it? And I think to me, one of the, the best things I, I recommend, used to recommend my students read all the time was The Federalist Number 10 by Madison. Simply put, Ma what Madison said was, the only way you'll ever have equality of outcome is if you limit liberty. If you give people freedom to achieve what they can based on their own potential, they're not going to work out even. Some people are better at some things than other people. It would be to expect any human endeavor. If you put 100 people in and they're all going to come out the same, they're all going to do exactly the same. That's utopian. I mean, like, you know, you, you put, you, you fill up, I don't know how many people are in the NBA players. You take the number of players in the NBA, you know, and, and you just pick people out there. The odds that they're all going to score, you know, they're all going to score 18 points a game, and they're all going to all get six rebounds a game, and they're all going to have, you know, four assists, and everybody's going to get paid the same. That would be absurd. Who would, who would even think that? Who would think that in the NBA, uh, you know, what, 90, 91% or 71% of the people in the country are white? So 71% of the NBA players should be white, right? And 13% uh, should be black and 13% should be Hispanic. And you should have a certain percentage of Native Americans. 52%, 51% should be women. <laughs> so is the fact that the NBA is overwhelmingly black, does that mean that whites are being discriminated against? Or does it mean that those, for whatever reasons, I'm not suggesting it's physical or genetic, or it could just be, you know, you know, why poor people tend to be boxers, white or black. You know, it could be economic origins and stuff like that. But why are, why do blacks dominate the NBA? Is the fact that, you know, whites are underrepresented a symptom of racism, evidence of racism? That's what Madison's getting at. You know, if, if you let people be free, you're going to get inequality. But we do, that doesn't mean we don't have inequality. It means we do. And the question is, what do you do about it? And what people want to do today is to use more regulation. I would argue if you look at the trends in history, the answer is less. And I understand that that's not always intuitive. It seems dangerous. We should have less regulation. 
What if people steal our money? What if people sell us bad food? And that's the problem. But I think if you look at history, you know, none of the options available to us, you know, whether you go to capitalism, communism, or Islam, Islamism, provides an answer. The world is far too complex. The world's pushing an infinite range of options that our finite minds cannot tackle. That's why they use algorithms for Twitter and Facebook. Things are happening on Twitter and Facebook too fast, too quick to have human beings regulate that platform. I'm not saying that the, the you know algorithms are code, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you, you got a biased guy writing the algorithm, you're going to get biased results. But still, I mean, that's where we're getting to today. That human beings cannot keep up with the speed at which the world is operating, at the speed at which the world is changing. And for me, that's the, the macro problem everybody on this planet faces. And I don't think anybody has the answer to the problem. And I think for, the, for a great extent, most of the people aren't even addressing the problem. And it is counterintuitive that the answer to the complex world is actually less regulation rather than more. That's what I mean by speed. That's the problem we face of speed. It's too fast for us. We can't keep up. That's my thought. Let me know what you think in a comment. If you can, subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Share the video with your friends. Give it a thumbs up if you can. And until the next time, keep fighting.